In the last few years, I've been directing a project that's a collaborative project between SUNY Geneseo and the Henry David Thoreau Society and an organization called the Walden Woods Project. And it's around um, giving more digital presence to the works uh, of Henry David Thoreau and scholarship about him. Uh, so some of this work has involved um, text encoding to produce an edition of Thoreau's Walden that enables you to, to follow um, Thoreau's revisions through seven manuscript versions. Some of it's around building a social reading site for uh, reading Thoreau's works. Uh, some of it's around an archival site that students at Geneseo have been building about the life of a Thoreau scholar who taught at Geneseo for many years named uh, Walter Harding. So there are, I have colleagues uh, at Geneseo who are doing um, a variety of uh, projects like this that involve digital tools, that involve uh, preserving cultural heritage or building databases. Um, and so we're looking actually at Geneseo to um, institutionalize and formalize a bit um, to provide capacity to support people's different projects and to get students involved in them. And we're also looking at ways uh, to help those students who uh, are interested in using digital tools but who are not connected to any of these faculty members or projects um, to develop their skills and to find projects to become involved in. I use WordPress. Um, I have students learn how to use WordPress. Um, I have them blog on the open web in connection with some of my courses. And uh, the English department has created a WordPress uh, network that uh, makes it possible for people with shared interests across courses um, to, uh, to work together in groups to maintain blogs of their own. So this network enables some of my colleagues to have students um, blog on the open web in connection with their courses, creative writing courses, American literature courses, uh, and, and so on. Let me quickly mention another tool that I didn't mention earlier that I think is important, um, uh, an open source uh, archival tool called Omeka. So that Walter Harding site I mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago um, that takes um, documents from uh, one of our library's collections um, and makes it possible for students to put those online and then to provide useful metadata about them and then to combine the documents into interesting narratives. Um, that's, that's a tool that um, um, I think is, we're going to see become increasingly important, important in humanities study that um, we're trying to help our stu students learn how to use. I've had students contribute to the Digital Thorough Project that I mentioned. Uh, before and so to do that they learn how to do some basic text encoding with XML uh, TEI um, and I have students using annotation tools to have conversations uh, in the margins of texts. Those are uh, a few examples. Um, uh, we have some other courses in which students have been learning some basic coding skills, learning to use Python for example for text analysis and increasingly I've been trying to bring that uh, into my classroom. So in literary studies in recent years, a term that's been used for this kind of approach um, has been distant reading. And so that is a kind of a, a contrast to the practice that historically has been kind of at the heart of literary studies of close reading. Um, and these are two ways of approaching texts that really can complement one another. So uh, it's important to look closely at small bits of uh, text, passages, words, sentences to understand how they're related to the larger whole. Um, you can also relate any given text to much, much larger wholes. If you have um, uh, a large corpus of texts that you can uh, search for patterns in using tools like 
Python. So that's the kind of work that increasingly has become important in literary studies that we want our students to be able to engage in and understand. The Stanford Literary Lab produces a steady stream of analyses uh, of this kind that are really interesting. And, and one of the most uh, frequently uh, cited is one by Franco Moretti, in which he looked at the titles of, I think it was 7,000 um, uh, novels published between um, the mid 18th century and the early 19th century uh, to understand what the changes in the length of novel titles and the kind of information contained in them uh, suggested about the increasingly commercial turn of novelists during that period and uh, the different ways of understanding um, what the function of a title is. So, uh, for example, he contrasts some very lengthy titles of uh, 18th century novels, which are essentially kind of capsule summaries of what the book is, uh, to a title uh, from, from the late 19th, early 20th century, like Heart of Darkness, where now the title is uh, an interpretation of some kind of, of the meaning that is embodied in the novel, um, but it's a, it's a somewhat obscure interpretation so that the title itself requires interpretation, right? So those are some examples of the kinds of things that he finds by taking a step back from looking at individual works and looking at lots and lots and lots of works together to track the changes that have taken place over time. I think that the, the main function of some of um, the distant reading work that people ha have done has been to, um, to raise new questions that you then can only answer by doing the kind of close reading that literary scholars have traditionally done. So, um, it's not clear uh, that, it's not clear how often um, distant reading can answer uh, an important question. Although some of the scholars who are doing it, I think are increasingly um, uh, generating questions that might only be answered by this kind of work, trying to, to track um, broad shifts and changes in attitude um, among writers and readers over large periods of time. But I, th I, I think more often the value of this work is that it then drives you back to close examination of particular works um, to understand them in some new way. Uh, I mean, you're essentially doing at a much larger scale something that scholars have always done, which is to, to think about the individual work in larger contexts. One of the earliest examples of what you would call digital humanities work, even though it wasn't called that at that time, is from uh, the late 1940s, um, a concordance of the works of uh, Thomas Aquinas um, using um, a computer to build it, right? So concordances from before the digital age have been an important tool for scholars because they, they give you um, a way to uh, reorganize the content of works um, so that you can find things and you can count instances of things, right? So that you're not reading through the works linearly, um, but now you've got all examples of some particular word listed together and you can think about those things together. You can build much more of those and you can build them much faster using digital technology than you could do them uh, by, by hand. And um, that, again, is what you are looking to do with the results is the sort of thing that scholars have always done, which is to search for patterns. Um, I, I got interested in digital humanities work partly um, through my own interest in um, uh, how the use of some particular word by a writer in a work or across works 
might be a key to understanding something about that writer's thinking. So um, in, the, in the late, I think it was the late, yeah, in the, in the late 90s, I started thinking about how often um, Dickens referred to people's hats in uh, his first novel, Pickwick Papers, and thought I saw something really interesting there, but didn't know, um, because he wrote many works, and, and many of them are very long, right? And d didn't know, well, am I seeing more hats in this novel than, I, than there are in other Dickens novels? How in the world would I go through all the novels looking for all the references to hats and count them up and make a comparison? But at that time, somebody, well, by, by a few years later anyway, somebody had put an electronic concordance to the works of Dickens online, a Japanese scholar, um, with a little, you know, drop-down uh, web interface. And um, I was able to actually do that work and discover that um, uh, the, the density of references to hats in Pickwick Papers was, in fact, significantly larger than it is in other works by Dickens. And it, it, it so I already had the intuition, right, that there was something interesting there. I didn't need this tool to discover that, but the tool could confirm for me that the intuition was right, and it could, it could um, now lead me to ask new additional questions about what this might mean uh, about what Dickens is trying to do in this work. So the distant reading part was the building of the concordance by the scholar whose work that I was drawing on, and it went into the service of a close reading of that particular work. None of this takes out the need for um, human interpretation. It, it increases the need for human interpretation because now you, you, you can find patterns that you couldn't have found before. Now there are new things that need to be explained and it takes a human mind to do that explaining. In order to make it work, I have to spend some classroom time explaining to students how the tools work, making sure that they can set up accounts um, uh, on different platforms um, uh, uh, on WordPress, uh, maybe on Slack, maybe on GitHub, right? Um, and uh, on the one hand, that's time that I'm not spending talking about uh, Dickens or Thoreau. On the other hand, um, I'm helping them gain some new schools and in, uh, skills and introducing them to some new tools that, again, it will be very useful th for them to know uh, after they graduate. So, um, so I'm happy to do that. I feel like it's, 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 um, it's serving an important educational purpose.